to uh, this Mid Scotland meeting of the Scottish Forestry and Timber Technologies um, group. Uh, we had hoped on this second anniversary exactly of lockdown to maybe be able to have the chance to meet face to face or at least to have a hybrid meeting. But uh, here we are meeting virtually as we have done for the last uh, the last couple of years. Uh, thanks everyone for, uh, uh, for, for turning up and uh, thanks to the industry leadership group as usual and to Scottish Forestry and to CONFOR for uh, the organisation. Uh, the themes for the, today's meeting um, are what we need in forestry skills, education and training and then we're going to talk about uh, the interaction of squirrels, reds, greys, pine martens and woodland types. And I hope everyone has had the chance to see uh, the update, that the industry update that uh, Jamie uh, kindly circulated the other day from, from CONFOR. Um, we're starting, starting off on uh, forestry skills and um, really pleased uh, to welcome um, uh, to give us a, a presentation uh, Neil Cleland who's the deputy head at the Scottish School of Forestry Inverness College University Highlands and Islands. Um, I don't think uh, we ever really had a time in, uh, in my length of uh, career within the forest industry where we've seen quite such a demand for people. Uh, that's uh, from uh, contracting resource right through the whole management setup. It's a really fantastically exciting time to be part of the industry. Um, and uh, I think in common with a, a lot of uh, industries, uh, people are struggling to recruit. Um, I have never seen quite as many forestry vacancies being advertised on the ICF website. Uh, it used to be that you could go for a whole year and not see as many uh, uh, as many vacancies as you'll see at any time on the ICF website. So um, I said delighted to, to welcome Neil. Neil started his forestry career in 1982, which is maybe giving your age away a wee bit, Neil. But um, uh, and uh, that that was uh, uh, right at the YTS training level, uh, so a very young person uh, back then. Um, in 1984, he began work as a chainsaw skyline operator at Fastfern Estate over at Fort William, uh, then went on to do an OND course at the Scottish School of Forestry in 1986. Spent his mid-year uh, in that course working with the Forestry Commission at Delamere in Cheshire. Then uh, went back to the Scottish School of Forestry to uh, continue his OND, which he very bravely admitted in his uh, in his biography that he, he did not complete, uh, but did go on to find employment with uh, Till Hill in North Yorkshire. Uh, he then moved back to Inverness in 1991 as a self-employed contractor and started uh, lecturing on a part-time basis at the Scottish School of Forestry in 1992, then became a full-time lecturer in 1995, uh, training adults with special and additional needs at Cantry Bridge uh, Rural Skills College just outside Inverness, where uh, during that time he also learned British Sign Language and became fully qualified as a sign language interpreter. Uh, it went back to the Scottish School of Forestry in 2002 as a part-time lecturer while continuing his career as an interpreter and then became a full-time lecturer at SSF in 2011 and the deputy head of school in 2020. So uh, there will be very few people who are more qualified to talk on uh, um, forestry skills and training than Neil. So over to you, thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, I forgot to mention all that. I went back to college in 93 to get my HND um, alongside uh, people like uh, Neil Stoddard and Robert Taylor, Craig Nimmo. Uh, they were my, my cohort in 93 to 4 and then I went and got my degree in 2002. So I have officially got, I got a forestry BSc. Um, so I do feel <laughs> more than qualified. I didn't just make it here just by the skin of my teeth. Um, yeah, I think you're quite right what you said. It's an exciting time to come into the industry. There's so much scope out there. I mean, we've, there's plenty of uh, sort of reports 
and research linked with uh, the, the aging um, uh, sort of the forest employee basis and it's looking at how we retrain us and I think where we are at the college here um, we just need to make sure that we are up uh, at, a, at a position where we can assist with making sure that the future foresters are educated and ready to roll uh, when they hit the ground when they come out into industry. I mean we have always had long before I was there we've always had a fantastic uh, reputation and link with industry. Uh, I mean, I see David Leslie's uh, in the meeting. A few other, I see also see um, sort of Andy Leach and various other folk who've obviously come through the system. But I think for me um, to see what is available, as you say, on the ICF website, but also from so many other different avenues, and it's not just forestry based. You know, you look at the the kind of the the, the tertiary sector, etc., and the wider base of arboriculture. Um, urban woodlands, uh, looking at timber technologies, I mean, it is massive. I mean, I've, I just had a meeting with uh, some Denmark uh, foresters, Danish de uh, foresters today, looking at how they can link in with the uh, awards and also potential some uh, sort of reciprocal collaboration within the education side of things. So I think what we have to offer at the Scottish School of Forestry, we have to make sure it's robust. I know the degree programme um, has just been ratified recently and it's proven um, as strong as ever. My issue has always been is retention so getting our students in and retaining those students um the big impact we've had recently has been covid i think we have had folks saying let's covid's in the back it's gone but there is a massive knock-on effect uh, that, that is impacting our students and the staff um, which we are looking at how to resolve just now the major issue we've got at the moment is at the fe level the practical level is trying to get those youngsters and uh, career changes. We have a lot of career changes coming through um, uh, sort of at all levels, to be honest. And it's just making sure that, that we have a provision for them, which I know there's a provision out there, but it's trying to get them that consolidated training which they require. Once we've given the, the basic stuff, they need to go on into industry and get the, the consolidation, whether it's at a lower practical level or into the lower management level and moving on into the degree. So I think we are at a, a fantastic um, sort of crossroads, as it were, uh, looking at what we deliver and how we deliver. I've been in conference with uh, Ben Clinch over at Murray Estates looking at how the MA programme that we are running at the moment, you know, how it can be, how it can fit more easily into the private sector uh, requirements. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, Forestry and Land Scotland set up just now, which works really well. But what we have noticed that the private sector, it's, it's a little bit, bit disjointed. I'm going to hold my hand up to that. I can see that's disjointed. It's not worked as smoothly as I'd like to, it to have, have worked. So we're looking at how um, we can then improve that provision to the private sector and open up the doors and, and encourage more people at a, at a kind of a, an estate level to come and join us at the practical level. Uh, creeping up into the um, the higher, the HN, HNC, HND, uh, it's become increasingly obvious that when students go on to placement, which we have always encouraged, and I have to say industry have been fantastic in supporting that placement year for the HND foresters. I'm also looking for the HND um, arboriculturalists to be offered that as well, but the moment the HND foresters get it, uh, industry have been absolutely superb as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I have upwards of 30 to 40 industry positions been offered it doesn't just obviously come to us it's it's you know obviously national and to all the, the universities that are out there they're still providing forestry um but i think it's important that we we keep that going and um, for, for me the forestry you uh, know forestry advisory committee that we have it's vital that they are involved with that input to ensure that what we train or how we train our students here and the courses and the units that we provide is what the industry is required um but for me, I've also noticed that there's a lot more students disappear, as it were, into industry once they've completed just the first year and the placement. They're held on by industry, which I don't blame them. I mean, if you've got a good student, why would you want to let them go? You've, you've put them through a year of training, um, a year of kind of uh, showing them how to do it your way. Um, and I would, I'm not going to in discourage that because I think it's vital for these guys to be kept in employment and shown the way. The most important thing is they're given that provision to complete their education because I think we're looking at a lot of graduates coming through or graduate approach for graduates who are currently either with Forestry Commission England and Forestry and Land Scotland who didn't complete their education, who are now coming back to try and complete their education. So it's almost a case of, yes, I mean, I, I will name James Jones because they have been they, they've been very supportive in making sure any students that go to them continue and complete up to their degree where they can. So you know, organize, organizations like that right across the board, we'll work with them. You know, I'm, I'm not going to have put any barriers in the way. I would like to work with these organizations 
to ensure that that program is kept up and running and suits industry and it works with industry. Um, so we are looking at how we tweak our curriculum um, in the next few years to make it work and be more suited to what industry is required. Creeping up into the degree again, uh, we lost a lot of students last year simply because of COVID. They did not return to do the BSE. They went straight into industry or left completely. So I'm in conference with them at the moment to try and encourage them to come back, at least work part time um, or full time where they can so they can actually get their degrees. So we, we haven't, as far as I'm concerned, we haven't lost them. Uh, we're just trying to try and find them and get them come, come back onto, onto the stream. So anyone who's out there in industry who may have uh, some of our HND students from last year, you know, please encourage them to come on to us to allow us then to finish off their, their BSc training um, and hopefully onto masters if if they if they so wish to go that that far up. I think forestry is a sector we need to be looking constantly at how we can move with the times. You know, whether it be on the carbon capture side of it, the the industry technologies, t timber technologies, the basic forestry side of it. Uh, you know, I think we need to be proactive right across the, the sector to ensure that anybody coming into industry is prepared and ready to go. Um, we do have issues obviously with uh, provisions. I mean our facilities here we are limited with the size of it, just the nature of the size of the college. But what we are trying to do is ensure that what we do have and the, the students that we do have coming through us are our um, organisation go to you ready to go. Yes, they're rough diamonds, you know, that there will be aspects where they will need to be tweaked a little bit, firmed up or, you know, smoothed off a little bit. Um, but that's the nature of how we work with you guys. Um, and certainly I'd be looking at any questions from you in respect to what you would like to see from us or any ideas at how you may feel we could potentially, you know, increase that provision. I mean, I'm in conference today with a guy, Martin White, who's uh, who links with our uh, executive management team and we're looking into um, setting up a, a sawmill training uh, simulator to link in with the sawmill industry. Now, how that's going to work, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, I know I spoke with, um, with James Jones in respect to how we can widen that out, bringing in the engineering team down at the main campus. Um, my a boss, Carrie Higgins, uh, who's the head of uh, our school, head of our department. She and I are looking at how we can link construction in with the timber technology side of it. Uh, and I have sp spoken to industry, um, certainly able through it, Forest and um, the, the NOR board as well. And what else can we do? What can we provide? What is required for industry? Yes, there's a lot of in-house training, but what is it the college here can do to help? So I'm kind of at that level just now where we are tweaking things to make sure we are sustainable, but also I'm needing industry to come in and, and support us and back us to make sure that we continue going on. We've been here for over 40 years as a college. Uh, I think about 42 years, 43 years actually. Um, and one of our longest surviving members, John Christensen, recently survived. I was retired, sorry. I'm happy to call at the moment, but if you leave your name and the telephone number, I will call you back. Not sure where that's come from. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, so that, that's kind of in a nutshell, that's where we are at just now as a college, how we're going forward. As I say, our staffing, we are going through a recruitment process just now uh, to bring our staff back up to level. I've, I've got a, a two members of staff to, to join me. I've got a gentleman in Australia who has come from the Australian forestry side of things. He's joining me in April this year. So he's going to be uh, sort of geared at the higher higher education, second year and into uh, sort of uh, third year degree um, level. That's what he's uh, aiming for. I've had Annabelle Martin. I'm looking to um, pull her in as a member of staff as well uh, for, to obviously provide the nursery and the ecology side of things. Um, so our staffing is, is firming up nicely over the next couple of months and we'll be ready to go in September next year. So I'm not going to ramble on anymore unless people want me to. But if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Is that OK, Raymond? That's that's great. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Neil. Um, we'll open up the, the, the floor to, to questions, but um, I think one of the things that we, we might all appreciate is um, uh, that, that was a, a really good praise of what um, the Scottish School of Forestry is, is doing. Do you have any background on what other um, educational establishments who are offering forestry training uh, are, 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 are up to at the moment? 
Um, I know down at Barney, um, they're, they're linking in a little bit with Shruck and they're offering some more modern apprenticeships at the, I said, sort of the modern apprenticeship level. I Shruck, I was speaking to Melanie Smith a couple of weeks ago and they're having a wee chat with Shruck in respect to provision of a higher education uh, provision. I'm not 100% au fait with the details of that because that's something that has been uh, talked at at uh, Melanie's level. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody on, on the panel here has, has any information to put on with that. Um, but within Scotland, um, as I say, we're very limited uh, in that provision. Further south, Bangor um, is still providing forestry at the degree level. Um, uh, numbers wise, I'm not sure how they're getting on this year. Uh, it wasn't as high as they had hoped from the last time I spoke. Um, but certainly up to Cumbria, once again, I know they've gone through a bit of a change just recently and I can't honestly give any answers with response to Cumbria. Um, but certainly up, up where we are, the, the way things are going with forestry and the provision of forestry, I know down in Argyle, uh, there's a potential where we may link up with them looking at uh, provision of training for some of their apprenticeships. Um, numbers wise, once again, that hasn't been firmed up yet either, but that's a com uh, conversation that's, uh, that we are having at the moment or will be having in the next next few weeks. And are you getting lots and lots of applicants, uh, Neil? I mean, I, I can remember when I came into forestry, uh, the degree course at Aberdeen used to get something like 300 applications a year to, to, to um, do the forestry course. I don't know quite what went wrong there and why Aberdeen is no longer <laughs> offering anything. But um, I, I mean, are, are you finding lots of young people are being attracted to the industry or not? That that has been an area of concern, I think, for a long time. To be honest, Raymond, um, the, what we're finding is our applicants at the HND course. I'll use that as kind of the first year degree, if, if you want to look at it in that respect. Uh, this year, we're probably at the moment we're looking at we've got 31 applicants, which is we've we, we've never had any more than I think the most we've had is 48. And that was about two years ago, um, and then it's just who then progresses on. Occasionally, we get one or two who filter into the degree from other areas, so they may have done a degree down in either uh, Bangor or they've done a course down in Bangor or at Cumbria, or they may have done another degree somewhere else and they moved on to the honours up, up with us. Um, but we, we don't, we certainly don't have 300 students coming on. Now, the big thing, we've got a big push. I've got a meeting uh, this evening again with uh, the STEM, uh, 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 Janie Irvin, looking at how we can target schools to ensure that the, the youngsters coming through, and I think this is where the big problem we've had for quite a few years, has been that the youngsters been pushed to us from schools don't fully appreciate what's required or what, what do they need to have to actually get onto the courses and what is actually available. Yeah, I know um, Andy Leach and uh, Liz Barron and Mariak and quite a few folk are you know, targeting uh, these areas now. Amanda Bryan certainly with us looking at how we can ensure that schools understand what is required and also what is available once they actually come onto, onto the, into, this, into the training sector. Um, I think the issue we've got is making sure that those kids are ready. A lot of the kids come to us and they struggle with the requirements or they struggle with, they may have a, a higher in art or a higher in, in creative or whatever, but they don't necessarily understand what is required um, for sort of entering forestry at, an, at a basic educational level. And also a lot of the students who go straight into HND, even though we recommend they do the practical course, struggle because they don't fully appreciate the practical side of the forestry. I think it's just, uh, you know, I remember coming through, I had to do a two year um, pre course practical before I, I was any allowed anywhere near the, the college grounds. Um, and that really set me, you know, on, on the right path and sort of got my head working what I was what I was working towards. Now, whether that's something we can try and encourage again, certainly for the direct entry on the HND um, for, for some of the students, certainly younger students, I think it's just something we may have to reconsider whether that will work or not, I don't know. Um, you know, obviously for quite a few years that hasn't been the case, um, but it might be something worthwhile looking into just to ensure that students and the potential foresters of the future are, are ready to go. Uh, oh, so I've just seen Harry's comment. Uh, percentage entrance complete the degree. Uh, what we find is um, the Percentage of uh, coming in at HND level, we're probably looking probably only about 15%, 20% actually complete the degree. However, uh, the last couple of years, I'm trying not to count them. Well, I should count them, but COVID has had a massive impact. So I'm looking at potentially having up to 16 to 20 students return on the degree this year, which is uh, unheard of. Uh, I mean, when I did my degree back in 2002, there was 12 of us doing the degree. 
And I think the highest we've ever had coming through at that level has been 15. But certainly looking at the students that we've got coming through this year, um, we potentially have going, we're going to have um, at least another um, 20 students coming onto the degree this year with the hope that they'll go onto the honours as well. Probably won't be 20 onto the honours, but certainly onto the, the third year, there'll be 20. Thanks, Rob, about the, the apprenticeship down in the, the Cumbria. Any other questions? Yeah, don't don't be shy, folks. Come up with the questions. <laughs> I mean, I mean, one thing I will say to everybody, you know, we are coming out of COVID. We are opening up. Uh, we've got the campus open. As I say, I had uh, the first visitors from uh, from a Danish organisation. Uh, I'm not sure if you know anyone knows Colin Mann from Scottish Woodlands. He he was the main instigator behind it, looking at uh, an award um, for graduate students, but also potentially, as I say, an educational link up. So you know, if anyone out there wants to come and see what we're doing up here come and you know have a meet us face to face um then you know i'm, I'm certainly have, have got my doors wide open for that yeah okay uh jamie jamie has asked um is, is there more the private sector should be doing to engage with schools i th i think you know we are lucky where, I, where we are, because you know, the private sector around about us, you know, I look at Ben Clinch at Murray Estates, I mean, Steve Connolly with uh, Court of Forestry um, and uh, other organisations in the local area. And I think certainly, um, uh, um, I've, gone, I've gone, his name's just gone out of my head. That's terrible, actually. Uh, it'll come back to me. But there's quite a few locals who come along with us, go to schools and go to their their, um, their careers ev events, careers even as Johnny Dean at uh, Gordon Sawmill uh, with Cat Lindroth as well. So. We have got a lot of good um, uh, link-ins with the local sector. Now, for me, I would go back out to the local sector and please get in touch with your local schools and go in, encourage the kids to see what you do, to see what is available in forestry, not just the chainsaws, the tractor driving. It's all the other stuff. I mean, the local nursery, the Annabelle Martin at Christie's Elite, she linked in with the local schools to um, to get them involved with the nursery work. Uh, you know, to, to, I think they had a session every Friday going down, helping to do the grading and doing various exercises just to show the kids what's involved. But then the, the next step on. So I think for private sector wise, definitely. Oh, there you go, Andy, definitely be, become STEM ambassadors. It's something which, you know, if we can get into the schools at an early stage, primary schools as well as secondary schools, just to get that message out there that it's it's not just all about chainsaws and tractors it's everything else that's out there i mean the scope in forestry is massive and we all know that i'm talking to the converted here but it's i think it's just important that we get that private sector and public sector definitely and just on the stem ambassadors uh, uh, front um would it be useful if, uh, if if i know that they have been circulated before but uh, would it be useful to uh, have the um, details of how you could go about becoming a stem ambassador um uh, sent out to, uh, to 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 the to, to the group here i think i can certainly go to andy leach to answer that one yep thank you andy definitely i think that's uh, definitely a good idea I think I'd actually, actually encourage it for anybody to get involved. I think certainly um, you know, the experience I'm looking at just around looking at people's names. Some of you met, some I haven't met. Um, I just I've just seen Colin Hossack make a comment as Colin and I we were in our class, class together in '93 as well. Um, I think it's just something that's it's vital that we keep that uh, that going, that that connection with uh, the school education system. And I think almost. I'm not quite sure lobbying is the right word, but I think when I look at the students coming through, coming from schools, I have to question, you know, me personally, I'm sorry, some people disagree with me, but the curriculum for excellence and the preparation for guys coming in, I'm going to use the, the good old fashioned three R's, you know, sort of read and write and arithmetic. It's basic stuff, which give us the basics. We can then deal with it. I know a lot of you organizations, certainly at Till Hill, have taken graduates from various other uh, um, sort of um, skills and managed to, you know, they, they, they nurtured a forester out of it. And I think it's fantastic to be able to do that. But if you've got the basic understanding of um, of those three R's and, you know, science or, or some kind of base uh, understanding of what the environment's all about, then you've, you've got a chance to mold that student into a forester or 
and industry sector uh, forester, whether it be the uh, the sawmilling industry, the timber technologies, the nursery, the harvest and the stuff. You know, there's, there's so much scope that's out there. I think I didn't fully appreciate what the um, what forestry could offer me when I went in as a YTS student because I just went in for I wanted to play with chainsaws and climb trees. That's what I wanted to do. And I look back at what I've done over the over the past sort of nearly 40 years. You know, it's it's been exponential. Uh, and I look at the experiences I had with Forestry Commission certainly doing the and they really were my lead for the recre the education and the rec rec recreational side of it. Sorry, oh, that's my my phone. I apologise. Um, that's a box of chocolates. There's a fine in the college here, um, and it's just something that I think for me, the more input we put into schools, into education, to say prepare the students, prepare the pupils for coming out, and be ready because we do need maths. We do need English. We do need to be able to prepare. I know there are systems out there to assist folk who do struggle with that side of things. I'm not saying you know we block them off. There's ways and means of dealing with it. And I think we should be working with the schools to help them by the time they come to us, and then we can then nurture them and move them on. Thanks, thanks, Neil. Um, Martin Bars, can I ask you to turn your camera off, please? Thanks, um, Neil. Just just following on from. Uh, uh, Colin Hossack's uh, question there. He, he, he was he was asking whether um, there was scope for the Scottish School of Forestry to increase its capacity if there was more placement support from the sector. Um, I, I, I guess the link linked to that would be, you know, what 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 is, what is it that's preventing um, more students coming in to Scottish Fo School of Forestry? Is it placement support or is it just the lack of people wanting to come in? I think I think I mean it's de I would definitely say it's not a lack of placement support. As I say, the last I mean I took over uh, the role as placement coordinator here, here about eight eight or nine years ago from Neil Valentine, and all I can say is I mean the support from industry has every year I've had more people from not just here south of the border across the pond. You know I've I've got a uh, potential two placements in Australia coming up this year, and this is through my uh, the new lecturers coming in uh, Keith Lamb. Um, you know so the placement side of it. Yeah, give me more placements. I'll, I'll, I'll take them. Um, it just means the students have got more choice. But I think for me, it's getting the students to come to us, actually apply, know what they're applying for. You know, we're, we're trying a different marketing approach. I mean, working in with um, so the STEM side of things just now, and say so that's the, the meeting I've got this after this, uh, after this one, um, looking at how we can target the schools and target, uh, you know, the, the right organisations to make sure that the, the students or the even the change of career um, uh, folk, they know what they're coming in for. And as I say, every year, I think the most I've had applications wise has been 48 at the HND first year in forestry. At the arboricultural side, the most I've had has been 22. Um, and for some reason, it just doesn't seem, it just seems to, that seems to be a glass ceiling. It just seems to get to that, that level and it doesn't seem to get any more. And we've tried different ways of targeting various organizations going to the schools looking at uh, that that's including our progressing students so we've got students from level five and level six who automatically or, or they progress on to that hnd program so you know it's a it's it's how we can uh, increase that um provision which we can to assert to a limit because i mean we are restricted to the you know the number of, of uh, students we can have face to face in the college for various various reasons but if we see that increasing, then the argument for increasing that provision, you know, the, the facilities um, and the staffing, then um, that can happen. We, we are flexible in that respect. So, I mean, that answer there, yeah, please, more placements. You know, I'd, I'd cry out for more placements. Uh, I think the more we can get, the better. And I don't just mean in good old fashioned forestry. I mean, right across the sector. You know, we've had some great um, placements in sawmills. Balcast are on, on stream for the first time this year. Uh, I've got Glenn and brothers have come on board as get as well um, and Northern Ireland Forest Service. And so it's for me, it's it's what what I can get. I'll take. Um, but the question is how we can increase the students coming to us. That's what me and the staff are looking at just now. We are looking at how we can market it. Um, the STEM side of things, STEM ambassador side of things, I think is going to be a real help this year, targeting the schools to make sure the kids coming along know what they're looking for or know what we're looking for. I think that's the important thing. But also for them to see what's next, who who we, who what happens when you finish here, where do we go? 
I mean, we still got, I think, a really good, um, what's the, what's the one look for retention into forestry. I mean, we're looking at between 85 and 90 percent of our students who start with us go into forestry at any level. You know, so when I think about that as a, as a college university, um, I do think that, uh, you know, we've, we've got quite a good reputation and a good sort of um, uh, sort of uh, experience in that. So I would like to see that up a little bit, but also I would say, as you, I'd like to see the numbers increase and the industry is crying out for it. So yeah. if you've got any advice for me, I, I will be more than happy to listen to it and discuss how we could go further forward. But I'd say that Andy has um, uh, kindly put up the, uh, the 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 link for the forestry ambassador schemes for STEM. Right. So uh, that, that that's excellent. So like that young Jay in the background, uh, your uh, uh, your photograph there, Neil. <laughs> well uh, spotted. That, yeah. that might help for catching them young. Eh? Um, <laughs> link to that. Uh, Cameron Maxwell has asked what uh, what the opportunities might be for getting mature students in. Um, opportunities, Cameron, um, come and speak to us. Now, if you're coming in with a, what I call plenty of industry, industry experience, um, then you've got options. You can come straight into the HND program, HN first year program, um, but you could also come on either full time or part time. There, there are opportunities. If you're a, a career changer, we have what we call the PDA, which is looking at uh, sort of like part time distance learning, uh, which kind of uh, gives you uh, just, just under half a HNC credit. Or the, so the, the, the credits required for HNC. Um, but the way I look at it, if you're a mature student coming in, come and speak to us. We will then look at what your background is, what your experiences are. And if you've, you know, if you've got a BSc or a HND in a, an equivalent, then we can look at how that factors into taking on the BSc or into the BSc, uh, BSc honours. So it's something that we're not adverse to, to that. We're more than happy to look at each individual, uh, each person on an individual basis and more than happy to then discuss it further. Yeah, it was just, Neil, um, if um, what how much interest you get from mature students. I know that um, anecdotally, you know, forestry's, there's quite a lot of uh, second career mature students that have come into forestry. It's whether uh, whether it's an area you actively try and tap up for, for students. I suppose we, we don't really tap up because we, we rely on, um, I suppose, the, the more mature um, students come to us directly. We have had a few, we've had quite a few on the, say, the PDA, um, which is a professional development award that we, we, we run every year. Um, but we do have people coming to us, dipping into just a unit here and a unit there. So it's not necessarily, on, they don't necessarily want a HND, they don't necessarily want a degree out of it, but they do come in and they, they pay for, that particular unit and an area which they may be interested in or they want to kind of uh, get a bit of experience, a bit of under better understanding. Um, so we've had local people, certainly from the community woodland side of it, we've had local people from community woodlands come to us for, you know, for, for a, a 12 week period sitting, you know, coming in for half a day or a whole day sitting one or two credits. So we, we are flexible in that respect. You know, what we just have to do is make sure that, um, that, that, that it's suitable for those people who wanted to come in. So we, we do do it, we do listen, um, and it's, I must admit, good point. It's something which uh, we probably need to look in and maybe look at a way of marketing it. Yeah, it was just that I'm conscious, I was just counting up in my team, and there must be sort of five people anyway that have come in to forestry in their 20s or 30s, and part of the route has been through distance learning, so a couple of them have come through Bangor University, through the MSc, and I guess it'd be interesting to know, do you think, you know, the MSc, you were saying that, you know, some of the agents have been quite good at picking up people with other degrees and then sort of training them into foresters. Is is the MSc a sort of a future way of, of getting hold of people rather than through a sort of undergraduate qualification? Well, we, we do run, you and uh, Bodich, he runs the uh, MSc yeah. programme through here. So we do have that as a as another option. Uh, sorry, how, many, thought, how many do you get in that? We don't get a lot. Uh, Ewan, unfortunately, is in another meeting. I would have called him in, but um, uh, I'm not quite sure the exact numbers on that. We do have up to about 10 or 15. Uh, I'm not quite sure who's on this year, but certainly last year we had about that. Uh, but Ewan is the main man uh, who runs on that. So I'll, I'll certainly um, find out from him the numbers. I can easily feed that back to the team. Yeah, it's really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. There was another tool. There was yeah, there was one from Jamie. Sorry, that was me looking uh, yes. from a pen. Apologise. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jamie. Um, magic wand, or the, um, it's a we uh, Scots pine pencil. Uh, magic wands. Um, 
I think that this is what uh, when I looked at to mentioned Annabelle uh, actually Chris's elite uh, because of the uh, the immigration uh, issue Brexit etc um, that's the, one of the main reasons why she got in touch with the local schools to try and encourage that I think you know I, I, when I was younger I mean I went out and did strawberry picking I did tree planting I did lots of stuff when I was younger because that's what I did and that's that's what I was encouraged into doing and I think right now it's getting back onto that and trying to encourage the youngsters to show them that actually there, there is a there is a, an industry out there they can get in they don't necessarily need a qualification to plant trees or work in a nursery um, but certainly they can get involved in it so you know we have a lot of, we have a schools program just now uh, coming through um, so we, we are in touch with various uh, sort of the, all the Highland schools on a Friday and Clodden Academy they've got their own uh, program which is going to be starting in September with us so we're kind of targeting the schools in that respect to try and increase the the awareness of what's out there in the rural and I'm going to use rural industries um, because obviously some of them aren't quite sure what they want to go but as long as we can give them that basic training the basic understanding of what they can achieve and where they can work. Now we have a lot of uh, local contractors uh, in the area and they are always flagging up you know the need for um, planters, fencers uh, and a variety of other um, skills and I know that they have you know either come through us or gone directly to schools to see if there's anyone willing and able to, to get involved. So we're kind of linking in, in a, using the schools, the skills to work program that, that we've been running the last few years to try to guide students into that, whether it be uh, forestry or um, ranging or gamekeeping or whatever. So we are trying to do what we can. The magic one side of it, I agree. I wish there was one. Um, I think we have got, um, it's not just this generation, it's, it's quite a generation of the last couple of years where the, this, this work ethic at a young age uh, they'd rather uh, computers work in Tesco's or whatever I'm not knocking them. as long as they're working that's a good work ethic but when it comes to the the working in the land I think um, it's it has been left to our um, sort of Eastern European uh, Canadian uh, sort of cousins and co colleagues to come over and do a lot of that for us um, how we get back into the swing of it of we providing as a nation providing that workforce I'm not sure. I think it's uh, back to that uh, the STEM ambassadors getting in early, getting into schools and showing them what what is out there. Thanks, Neil. I, I agree entirely with what you're saying about that. You know, getting into the schools is. Uh, meanwhile, we are trying to plug the gap by lobbying for an extension of the seasonal agricultural workers visa scheme, and we'll continue doing that uh, as much as we can. Thanks. That's good. Thank you. Well, we seem to have run out of questions there, Neil, and I know that you have another meeting at uh, at five o'clock on the subject of STEM. So good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> thank and, you for that. Uh, thanks very much indeed for, uh, for, for that presentation. Um, no problem. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, it's, it's it's actually it's nice to be involved and see people's faces and uh, get, get involved in something like this. I think it's important. It's vital. I think we have to work with industry and vice versa. Um, and the more that we can do at, a, at an educational level, at all levels, you know, if you guys know what we're doing uh, and we know what you want, then it makes our job easier. Then we can tailor and tweak. Um, uh, so what, how we provide and how we train people. So we're, we're certainly looking at that in the next couple of weeks to see what, how we're going to provide that for next next September. But if anybody needs to honestly ask me a question later, please email me. Um, more than happy to take any questions from anybody. And as I said before, if you are passing, uh, Sonny Baloch, any time you're more than welcome. Good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Neil. We'll let you uh, we'll let you get on to your next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Um, so we'll now move on to the subject of squirrels. Um, back in January this year, I'm sure many of us will have seen some pretty widespread media coverage, uh, including on the on the BBC. Um, about the results of a fairly long term research project which was undertaken in Northern Ireland by uh, Queen's Belfast and St Andrews Universities. And this was looking at the interactions of red squirrels, grey squirrels, pine martens and their uh, types of forests uh, which they which they prefer to live in. Um, and probably fair to say that there was some fairly r sensationalist media reporting uh, which kind of veered towards the conifers are bad and native broadleaves are good line. 
we thought it would be a, a good opportunity uh, to allow those who actually carried out this research to put forward the, 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 the findings of that, um, of that work to a, a forestry audience uh, without the media having its spin on it. So I'm really grateful to uh, Dave Tosh, uh, who uh, was one of the uh, um, authors of the, uh, the study, um, for stepping in at the, at the very, literally the very last moment. Um, uh, Josh Twining, who is um, uh, uh, who was, was part of the study and uh, who is now working in the States, uh, unfortunately had a family bereavement and uh, was unable uh, to, to, to take part. But uh, Dave, at less than 24 hours notice, uh, has, has stepped in there. Um, Dr. David Tosh is a mammal ecologist and who's the last 20 years has been working across the academic, not-for-profit and private sectors. And since 2014, he was working with Josh Twining uh, on exploring the relationship between red and grey squirrels and pine martens. So uh, over to you, Dave. Thank you. Cheers, Raymond. Cheers for that. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, I must apologise. I won't be as slick as uh, Josh will be because, uh, yeah, as, as Raymond said, I've, I've not had very long to prepare, but that's no excuse. I'll be able to introduce you to the, the topic we've been studying for a, a wee while now. Now, um, Raymond there said very much about the, the media. Uh, this is a problem we always have with uh, this research um is uh yeah people take from it what they want so hopefully today um, i'll be able to give you a bit more insight into what the the, the, the real messages we're trying to get across um in our work were so if you bear with me i'll just share my screen with you um, let's see. There we go. Okay, can you all see that? Is that hopefully that's uh, working for you guys? Looking good. Looking thanks. Good. Yeah. Brilliant. Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah, the role of habitat in mediating interactions between pine martens and squirrels. So, um, again, as Ray said, this is something that we've been working um, for uh, on for quite a long time now. Um, uh, and it's, it's definitely not been us. So you see four names in front of you there, but it's also involved, you know, uh, well over 100 citizen scientists. Uh, so members of the public that have helped contribute um, information to this project. So without them, we wouldn't really have anything to uh, to tell you today. So, so the, the, fo the talk, the focus of the talk is very much on the recovery of the pine martin, which is a native predator to the islands of uh, Britain and Ireland. Um, and it was uh, historically threatened. Um, uh, and it, as I say, we're very much interested in uh, understanding what the interactions were between this animal and the red and grey squirrel. So hopefully you'll realise you'll be fully aware of the history of um, the red and grey squirrel in uh, Britain and Ireland. But I'll just give you a wee, a wee recap here. So. Um, as you, I'm sure you're fully aware, the red squirrel uh, is native to Britain and Ireland. Uh, and back in 1945, this was the estimated distribution um, of the species. So um, there was a number of introductions uh, across Britain uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, uh, basically, uh, there was a small number of locations where the squirrels were introduced in England, and then uh, landowners started sharing uh, grey squirrels, uh, and they started to move about the country that way. Uh, in the island of Ireland, uh, there was only one known, uh, well, one recorded uh, introduction that occurred in County Longford in 1911, and that is believed to be uh, the source population for uh, the spread of the species across the islands of uh, Ireland. So, um, so with the introduction of uh, the non-native grey squirrel from uh, North America, um, we, we've we witnessed the replacement of the red squirrel across much of its former range um, across both Britain and Ireland. Now, this has been uh, a result of a number of factors. So the grey squirrel um, is, can be two, three times as large uh, as the grey squirrel. So it's it's got a much more, uh, bigger body mass. 
it lives at higher density, so greater numbers within uh, locations. Um, it has a, a, a higher breeding rate, it produces more litter um, that tend to be more successful. Um, and most importantly, um, grey squirrels are the reservoir host for a viral pathogen called squirrel pox virus. Now, grey squirrels are immune to this, but unfortunately, red squirrels are not. Um, so there's there's an added complication of another um, virus uh, impacting reds as well. Whenever uh, greys come into an area, it caught, induces stress, which then makes it red squirrels susceptible to, to that disease as well. So, so due to these uh, combined reasons, we've seen the retraction in the range of the red squirrel across much of its former range. Um, and despite the importance of um, efforts by foresters such as yourselves uh, and members of the public and NGOs to try and stem the flow of grey squirrels. Um, success has been uh, variable at best. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, histor historically, uh, attempts to uh, limit the spread of uh, grey squirrels have focused on control, but also um, within Scotland, there's been an adoption of um, uh, planting plans that have focused on creating a uh, stronghold uh, uh, management areas for red squirrels uh, and these are very much focused on the planting of large blocks of non-native conifer species so like primarily uh, Sitka spruce and Norway spruce. It's, it's believed that in these um, uh, habitats red squirrels have a competitive advantage over grey squirrels because grey squirrels evolved in North America in forests where you have uh, it's, it's primarily deciduous woodland where they come from. Uh, grey squirrels are able to um, exploit uh, um, nuts and seeds before they fully ripen um, and they need these larger uh, seeds because they are larger uh, body creatures. It's believed that the red squirrels can exploit conifer plantations better because uh, the small seeded species and they've evolved to adapt them. But so this uh, until very recently has been the primary means of uh, trying to ensure that the red squirrel has a long term future in Britain and Ireland by planting uh, these uh, Sitka Norway spruce plantations, particularly on a, a large scale in Scotland. In Ireland, there's not been as uh, joined up uh, strategy uh, forestry wise for the species. Um, but yeah, so a few years ago, um, as I'm, well, it's, it's now quite a few years ago, um, things things began to change. Um, after after years of uh, having a very much restricted distribution, uh, both in Britain and in Ireland, um, we have begun to see the comeback of the pine marten. So uh, what you see here in front of you uh, is uh, four maps um, of Ireland over time with recorded uh, presence of pine marten in 10 kilometer squares. So um, in the, the three uh, darker islands of Ireland to uh, the right, uh, where you have a, a black square indicates where pine marten presence has been confirmed. So that's either through scat surveys, uh, public sightings with photos, um, or a genetic confirmation. So what we've really begun to see over time progressing from the 1970s onwards is uh, an expansion of um, of a pine marten from uh, a restricted westerly distribution um, spreading east, north and south. So now um, why have we got this comeback over time? Well, it's largely thought that um, uh, legal protection um, through the banning of uh, use of strychnine uh, in the Republic of Ireland in 1976 and in the UK in 1981 has, uh, has led to the recovery that we see today. So um, it's possible that uh, recovery could have been quicker, but uh, as you probably know, forest cover in Ireland is extremely, excuse me, extremely low. So we're talking about 11% on the island of Ireland. So, um, so yeah, the, basically the recovery has been probably uh, helped by the banning of these poisons, but also hindered by uh, the way humans have modified the landscape in Ireland so much. So. But nevertheless, uh, we can see in the last 15 years, the population has really bound, bounded back uh, and that the pine marten is now recorded in all six, 32 counties on the island of Ireland. So 
uh, maybe um, focusing very much on Ireland because this is where our experience is. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about is, is, is based. The work is based, has been based, um, but it's similarly recorded within Scotland. Um, the Vincent Wildlife Trust have undertaken surveys um, across Scotland, and they've been showing the species uh, gradually moving uh, further south year on year. Um, and I believe you know it's uh, it's entered into the the northern counties of England now uh, naturally as well. So, so uh, uh, with increasing awareness of the recovery, um, with increasing anecdotal evidence, sorry, of uh, the pine marns that making a comeback in um, the island of Ireland, there was a PhD student called Emma Sheehy. She uh, set out to undertake some work um, to try and collect some information to show that that was actually happening. Emma then went uh, on to University of Aberdeen, working with Xavier Lambin to undertake similar, uh, to replicate similar studies in Scotland to see if, if the same situation was happening um, in Scotland as was being recorded in the island of Ireland. So, uh, so yeah, so Emma uh, and her work in Scotland used genetic sampling of the three species at three sites um, across the recovery from front which varied in time since recolonisation. So they found a negative relationship between pine marten presence and grey squirrel occupancy um, with a, a, a symmetrical um, positive relationship in red squirrels. So basically, um, why you see a decline in, um, in grey squirrels with uh, increasing uh, presence of pine marten, you also at the same time see an increasing uh, presence of red squirrels in those, sa those same areas. So this is this is showing that yeah, as the pine marten comes back, numbers increase, uh, grey squirrel numbers decline and red squirrel numbers go up. Now um, we did you know, similar work uh, within, within Ireland using camera traps rather than genetic studies and used uh, fancy mathematical models to find that uh, across that across uh, Northern Ireland we were seeing a, a similar sort of situation. So basically um, again as pine marten um, occurrence increased in an area, grey squirrel occurrence went down while red squirrel occurrence went up. So so we're seeing you know a, a local scale and a landscape scale that pine martens are having a negative effect on the invasive grey squirrel and, the po uh, and a positive effect on the native red squirrel. So, but no one up to this point had yet tried to predict the outcome um, of pine martin recovery on the grey squirrel uh, in uh, uh, a very mixed uh, landscape. So this is very, very much, these are very much focused on looking at forested habitats only. And, you know, the reason for this is because it's difficult um, to look at these, uh, uh, species at interactions, um, you know, typically in the scientific world, we tend to look at relationships between two organisms because it's quite uh, simple to work out the relationship between these two. But when you add another into the mix, it makes it quite a complex situation. So, um, and there's a lot of things that can uh, affect affect that. So, um, so yeah, uh, so. We're just taking us next. So, so uh, getting on to the point of why does habitat matter and how could it affect interactions between uh, the animals? So, so building on um, the work that uh, Emma had done and uh, we had done um, uh, over in Ireland, um, we decided to take the work a little bit further, uh, a little bit further, and 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 begin to uh, explore how habitat might affect the relationship because we're looking just at a very local scale previously and a landscape scale um, just to see if this was happening. But now we've started to try and drill down into the details of why it might actually be happening. Because I mean, I'm sure you've heard there's lots of stories about, oh, you know, the pine martens don't eat red squirrels because they run to the edge of branches and they're safe and stuff like that. That's, that's rubbish. Uh, we found that pine martens eat red squirrels and grey squirrels. But why would um, uh, pine marten eat grey squirrels over red squirrels? You know, to, to us that was a bit confusing. So, so um, in a lot of studies across the world, habitat is a very important factor in determining in determining uh, the numbers of pine mar uh, of a predator within a landscape, uh, the ability of that animal to to hunt uh, or 
uh, to detect prey uh, and for prey to uh, detect, avoid or escape predators. So, um, so we've got a little visual uh, representation here of uh, trying to show the complexity of native broadleafed and mixed woodlands in com comparison to uh, non-native conifer plantations. So these are just sort of the kind of interactions that you might have. This is just, as I say, it's not every interaction, but it's a simplified version of the interaction. So we would expect a native broadleaf woodland where there's a greater diversity in tree species, greater diversity in uh, ground flora, uh, birds, mammals, uh, small mammals, there'd be much more going on. So there's much more opportunities for uh, the pine martin to predate different species. And in uh, conifer plantations, you have a much more simplified system. So, um, yeah. Uh, so you've you've got a, a potentially within a native broadleaf woodland, you've got um, woodland that is long established, uh, you know, if not managed as a plantation. Um, but with conifer plantations, you know, you've got 30, 40 year cycles in in, in majority of uh, treescapes within. Uh, in Northern Ireland and how they're managed. So it's, it's much, and because it's um, a uniform, uh, simple landscape with generally one uh, tree species, you generally have a much more simplified food web or, or trophic interactions within there. So fewer prey species for, for the, the pine martin or any other predator to come along. So, um, so we might, in landscapes such as native broadleaf woodland, we might expect lower predation rates on red squirrel due to an abundance of alternative prey sources, whilst in conifer plantations uh, that are limited in their biodiversity value, we might expect to see much higher predation. So, so our hypothesis when we set out to do this work were like uh, these three in front of you. So, uh, so we want to look at the impact of the pine martin and grey squirrels. Um, and find out whether it was consistent uh, regardless of, of habitat. Um, uh, due to the naivety of invasive prey species to the neighbor predator. So the reason we asked this question is because um, uh, the grey squirrel comes from North America. The pine martin is not widely distributed within that species range. So it, in theory, it should not be aware of uh, the pine martin as a predator. It has the potential for this relationship to develop over time. Um, but, you know, it's potential that might explain uh, why pine martins select grey squirrels, maybe over uh, red squirrels. So second hypothesis, the interaction between the pine martin and the red squirrel are dynamic and dependent on habitat, with more structurally complex and diverse habitats resulting in lower impacts on native prey species. So basically you're spreading the burden. So in, a, in a, where you've got more uh, prey opportunities, you might expect the pine martin to be uh, a little less selective because uh, on one particular prey species because there's lots of uh, available prey out there. And then finally, you know, um, the, the competitively linked native invasive prey species interaction to be mediated by habitat. So this is where um, that the relationship between the predator and prey is massively influenced by the habitat. So um, yeah, we set out to test those with our work. So to do that, um, we uh, decided that we were going to go for fancy mathematical modeling. Um, but uh, to inform those fancy mathematical models, we went out and collected uh, a lot of uh, data from the field to inform those models. So there was no simulations here. There was no, um, you know, thinking, OK, this might happen, that might, that might not happen. It was actually collecting hard data uh, from the field. So this is where we worked um, with citizen scientists. So um, we randomly deployed uh, camera traps facing feeders. So you've, we, like in woodlands, we basically set up a camera trap opposite um, a feeder, usually about a two meter gap here, uh, if not a little bit further, in order to detect what species uh, might visit the feeder. Similarly, in open landscapes up, uh, such as this on the Moor Mountains, we dragged poles with us and set out uh, the same sort of feature here. So the reason we, we chose this method is um, citizen scientists, well, squirrel groups over in Northern Ireland did use the, this method quite uh, widely to monitor what squirrels were visiting uh, what location. So we modified the method slightly uh, and standardised it, which us scientists love uh, to do is standardise things. Um, so the information you collect in the woodland is comparable 
uh, to the information that you collect in non-wooded habitats. So, so we put them at the same height, same bait, same period of time. So they're left between seven and 14 days. And we put a deployment and uh, divided northern up and up into one kilometre squares and uh, focused on surveying those one kilometre squares. So in the end, <clears throat> um, so we, we kept the method as simple as possible to try and get as many people involved in the project as possible. So in the end, um, you know, we, uh, uh, repeat, we, we did a pilot a study in 2014 in County Fermanagh and then expanded it to the national level in 2015, then repeated it with Ulster Wildlife in 2018 and again in 2020 with Ulster Wildlife. So you can see um, we surveyed quite a lot of sites over this period of time, as is represented by uh, the dots on the map there. Then uh, to train citizen scientists, we did workshops um, around around the country, showing everybody what to do. We provided training videos, training guides, different things like that. Um, and uh, basically said, on you go, pick your own site, tell us what you find and um, we'll do the rest. So, finally some results, I'm sure you're saying. So, uh, so this just gives you um, a general trend of uh, what is happening with the three different species over time. So I'm not going to go into talking about what the probability of occupancy, but it's a measure of the species being within the location that you're you're surveying. Because basically we took those information from uh, the information from the say like 300 sites we surveyed in, in 2015 and then looked at the relationship between detecting an animal and the type of habitat and other features and then scaled up to the whole of Northern Ireland. So looking at our results is um, we see uh, the pine martin in blue its occupancy of the survey sites increased over time. Um, the grey squirrel's occupancy of sites decreased over the same period and the red squirrel uh, occupancy of sites slightly increased over time. So, um, so, uh, so that kind of agrees with uh, the findings of, of the other surveys. Um, so we found that the scale and impact of Martin recovery in both squirrels seen in these results uh, was, to be honest, pretty unexpected. Um, we didn't expect these results to be so profound. This 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 big decline in grazing, this big increase in, in red squirrels. Um, so how we so as I said, we took the information from um, the sites that we surveyed and then uh, put that into models to produce uh, basically uh, distribution, fancy distribution models. Um, of the three different species across the, the island of Ireland. So, uh, sorry, across Northern Ireland. So each column refers to the different spe species. Um, and what we've done here is simply compared uh, the occurrence of the three species in 2015 and 2020, and then compare, uh, looked at the difference uh, to get the, the percentage change in occurrence of the species over time. So. Um, so in, in these top two rows, the hotter colours, so that's red and orange, display areas with a high probability of occurrence. So if you look at grey squirrels, uh, the Greater Belfast area and other populated uh, uh, areas by humans, you see a, a greater probability of occurrence of the grey squirrel. Well, the, the red squirrel and pine martin tend to be forested areas, particularly in the west and south for, for the pine martin. So, um, in the bottom row, green is showing increases in occurrence with red uh, and red show, show declines. So where you've got brighter, greener colours, um, you've got a positive change uh, in the redder colours, you've got a negative change. So you can see with the grey squirrel, we have a reduction in the occurrence of grey squirrels over that five year period and uh, an overall increase in pine martin occurrence and similarly with the red squirrel, but not as, as profound. So, so yeah, so we've got evidence of the rapid recovery of the pine martin, uh, with the species now occurring throughout the region, um, and occupancy uh, remains highest in the southwest and forested areas. So that's County Fermanagh and South Tyrone and places like that. Um, and so yeah, uh, so in contrast, greys have undergone declines and have gone from the most widespread of three species to the most range restricted. For that period of time. So, uh, 
So these are, to be honest, these are completely unexpected. So these are the results that were really reported uh, in the media recently. And to be honest, we never went out looking for these. These were um, accidental uh, finds, um, but it, it really opened our eyes. So, um, so here we're looking at the co-occurrence of inter or interactions of the species as a function of different forest, forest types. So, so what we're looking here is um, uh, so red squirrels um, and uh, their relationship with pine martens here, red squirrel, uh, grey squirrels and their relationship with pine martin here. And then we're looking at uh, the different forest types. So we've got broadleaf forest, we've got conifer forest. So this is looking at the relationship between uh, red squirrels and broad, uh, broadleaf with pine martin, red squirrels and conifer with pine martin, grey squirrels and broadleaf uh, and pine martin, grey squirrels uh, and conifer and pine martin. And what you see here um, is basically uh, so, as I say here, so this blue indicates uh, the pine martin present, red indicates absent. So what we see here, when the when the um, pine martin is, is present within broadleaf woodland, uh, red squirrel presence increases. When it's absent, it declines slightly. Uh, in contrast, in conifer plantation, when um, now this was the really unexpected result for us in relation to red squirrels, when this native predator comes back into this non-native landscape, you, what you see is when pine martens are absent, red squirrels do just fine. You know the the, the increase in occurrence, but when you add the the pine martin into this non the native predator into this non-native landscape, what you have is a slight decline in red squirrel um, abundance. Now, in relation to um, grey squirrels and pine martin, what you see is basically uh, a suppression of uh, the population of grey squirrel populations. So whenever pine martins are absent, grey squirrels are running rampant. But what you see when the pine martins are present, you've got suppression of the population. And it's the same uh, in, in conifer plantations. When they're absent, um, grey squirrels do occur not in great amounts, but they're never usually present uh, whenever uh, Pine martens are present, so hopefully, hopefully that makes a bit of sense to you. Um, so, a summary of the results: so pine martin occupancy more than doubled in a five-year period, red squirrel occurrence increased by over a third, and grey squirrel occupancy more than halved. And we found unexpectedly that habitat modifies the direction and the strength of this relationship. So, basically, um, because. Uh, yeah, so uh, but not so it, it modified the direction and strength of the relationship between the native animals, so the pine martin and the red squirrel, but not the interactions between uh, the, the pine martin and the grey squirrel. So, so yeah, the big take home here is a very positive one. The restoration and recovery of native predators can provide control of established invasive species, but those benefits are spatially structured and habitat specific with benefits being highest in natural, structurally complex habitats, such as, excuse me, native broadleaf and mixed woodlands. We see, um, yeah, so the, the modification of, of, of human habitats can disrupt the existing relationship uh, between native animals, uh, which was the totally unexpected uh, outcome. So, yeah, what are the implications? So, um, so we'll see, well, we see that conservation strategies which do not consider the interactions between both the environment and species are subject to bias that may in turn lead to mismanagement. So focusing instead on more structurally complex timber plantations with a diversity of ages and a mix of species, including both native broadleaf and native conifers, will probably be better for um, a species like the red squirrel in the long term when uh, when recovery of a predator like uh, the pine martin has been promoted. Uh, in a landscape where you know we don't have much uh, native native woodland, so um, apologies um, for that hundred mile an hour thing. Hopefully it makes sense to you. If not, oh, I apologise, but please do feel free to ask questions. This paper is open. You can access um, open access uh, on the, uh, via the internet. So please do have a look at it, and if you do have any questions about it, do get in touch with with Josh or or myself or any other authors because we're more than um more than happy to have a chat with you. Um we're we're not 
we're genuinely not coming with um, any agenda here. So um, we're really interested to see what you guys have to say about it. Um, and it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely not finger pointing or, you know, blaming anybody for anything. This is just what we observed. This is what we found. So um, yeah, it was totally unexpected. But please, I'll stop gibbering and uh, you guys go for it. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, can I encourage everybody to um, uh, type in their questions into the chat room, please? But if I could maybe start off, of Dave. Um, you, you said that um, uh, relationships between a couple of species is something that's relatively easy to perhaps model scientifically uh, when you start to get into multiple species and different habitat habitat types and things it becomes much much more complex yeah um given that um my understanding i've got uh, kenny cortland of the uh, of um uh, forest and land scotland to to, to thank for uh, pointing yeah. this out um it, it's been found i think in scotland that um field voles have been a very big part of pine marten diet yeah. and that field voles are quite um, uh, 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 widespread within conifer plantations. Yeah. Um, field voles are absent on the island of Ireland, I believe. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, how much do you think the presence or absence of field voles might have, uh, 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 might, yeah. might change the, the, the results of this? I think they'll have a big, uh, a, a big role to play. Um, now, I know that um, Xavier Lambin up in Aberdeen is actually looking at that question. Like whenever you throw um, field voles into that mix, how does that affect the relationship? Now, I don't want to steal his thunder, but there is there is work coming out that's looking at that at the moment. Now, um, uh, it's something that we're maybe going to be able to look at uh, in the future in Ireland because field voles have now been found in two locations. So it's something that we will probably try and incorporate um, in future um, studies over here, but I have zero doubt. I had imagined because field voles are such an important part of pine martin diet that um, like pine martins goblin or relying on uh, the two squirrel species will vary massively depending on that. Um, I mean, what we find over here in Ireland, they have a much what we say a much more plastic diet, so it's much more variable because we just don't have this. this we don't have voles. Um, across mm -hmm. much of the landscape, so it's much, much simpler here. So, yes, more work needs to be done to look at the impact of those. But um, yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting. And watch watch the guys up in Aberdeen because they they are working on it at the moment. So um, I'm sure that will complicate things even. Uh, even yes, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, just as a as, as a bit of a supplement to to that. Uh -huh. um, We've moved a long way in the last 30, 40 years in the design of conifer dominated plantations, as, you, as you'll know, and that uh, new planting will generally contain quite a significant proportion of broadleaves. So um, I, I was wondering, firstly, what effect you think that might have on uh, red squirrel conservation and habitat for all, all of these species? Uh, and also, of course, we're, we're now um, well into second and third rotation forestry yeah. in a large part of the country, um, which even in conifer dominated plantations is giving you much more structural diversity uh, where you'll have uh, young restock sites with very high numbers of, of, uh, of voles, middle aged plantations and mature stuff. Um, I wonder what effect that do you think that well, might? Um, so you know, you remember with the uh, so the the broadleaf forest, you know, you've, you'd very much have the structural complexity. So if you can replicate that uh, in the, the the plantation systems, like with your different structures, your different age, um, like leaving wind blow areas, whatever, you create that mix, you're going to create a much greater um, uh, yeah the structural complexity, which the, will benefit the pine martin. Um, if that's if that's what you want to introduce to the landscape, it is potential as we go on with time that uh, because we don't uh, like in Ireland, forestry management, particularly in Northern Ireland, is not as developed as it would be where you guys are. 
So we have much, much more simplified systems. Um, so it is it's very, it, there's a great potential that over time, hopefully people will start to look at that. I mean, we're going to start getting that information. As long as we continue collecting this information over time, we're going to be able to add in, you know, the management cycles and the forest structures. So it is our hope that we're like, we're plans to repeat the survey again this year, but I hope we do it for the next 10 years because it's then we're going to be able to really go, OK, guys, this is what has a really positive effect and this is what is, has a negative effect. I mean, at the minute, you know, I'd only be speculating because it's something like we've just we've just not done because majority of this work we're talking about we've done it you know cobbling together what money we can so we need the universities like Aberdeen and whatever to apply you know work with um Forest Scotland Forest Research to try and develop these bigger studies to develop our understanding of how management impacts them because as you say you know particularly with red squirrel conservation we are still very much relying on stuff that was thought up 30 40 years ago and the landscape's changed, yep. both for you, how you manage the landscape and, you know, there's greater calls now for the introduction of animals like the, the pine marten. So it's going to change things even further. So we need to try and keep up. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think we'll ever get it quite right, but we'll, yeah, hopefully, hopefully yeah. We'll, we'll be a bit more. I'm sorry that's not more informed. Um, I mean, I'd love to be able to, I just don't want to overstretch what I can can, can say. Um, understood. Understood. Um, Cam Cameron, you had a Cameron Maxwell. You had a, a question about herbivore and impact. Could you uh, maybe uh, and expand on that, Cameron? Yeah, it was just. I mean, you probably answered it. Eh, to be honest, Dave, with your sort of talk about habitat, and I'm assuming that if you get increasing habitat complexity, which is sort of Raymond said, eh, you know, we're looking for eh, through the UK forestry standard with diversification of plantations. And we've got a particular problem in Scotland with herbivore impact, uh, yes. but also deer, both in broadleaf and in plantations, which tends to limit the the variety and type of plants and structure. So I'm assuming that if you get herbivore impact down, you start getting palatable species, uh, shrub species, raspberries, et cetera, et cetera. You just got a more complex habitat, then that kind of benefits everything. Yeah, it would, it would, because uh, the more, the longer I'm doing this, the more that we find is the habitat complexity has such a massive part to play. Um, yeah, again, I came into this completely naive of, of of what to expect, but this is something that's coming out, particularly with Pine Martin. What we're finding is, um, particularly like uh, denning opportunities, as you imagine, would be quite limited in uh, conifer plantations. But when you've got wind blown areas, when you've got disease impacted areas, you know, this creates uh, alternative denning opportunities. Like, you know, when you've got your massive brambles, they will actually den under that. You know, if you've got wind blow, they're in the root plates. You know, when you've just got, you know, your, 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 flat. your yeah, flat nothing nothing much is happening so yeah i mean i would advocate that you know and i appreciate it, it doesn't uh, particularly help um with production um but you know if if that can be tolerated to a degree you know it's 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 a positive thing for the wider uh biodiversity but yeah i can understand deer yeah voles yeah all those sort of things are the kind of things that you're really struggling with great thanks yeah. Um, we heard, we've had a, re a request, Dave, um, uh, if you could put up your um, charts again, the, um, the, 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 with the, the squirrels, the, the, the um, martens, and uh, the, the, the red and blue lines, if I remember rightly. Oh, right, sorry. Yeah, um, do you and, want me to go and, back? And, uh, yeah, please, if you could put that up on of the course. screen. And then I think related yeah. to that was a question from um, Simon Stewart. Um, Simon, would you like to uh, uh, ask, ask Dave? If I could turn on the mic and camera, yes, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just, I was trying to follow the, 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 the diagrams as well. So the, the, the number of the fall in the red squirrel and uh, the fall in the grey squirrels would account for some of the rise in the red squirrels, for, for instance, the yeah. next habitats. Um, so it, it was a, it was more. A, I'm just thinking that the, 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 the reason for this, of, of course, is that yeah. saying that conifer plantations aren't good for red squirrels at all. But the the fall in the red squirrels was not that massive, 
which you would expect when you you would expect some fall with the the the, the predator coming in. But in the broadleys, because because the ray, we go back to your um, network uh, one as well. So if you take out one prey species, such as the grey squirrel, if, the, if they've been predated heavily, would you not expect in time, once the, the numbers have come down so far, that you will get increased uh, uh, predation of the red squirrels as well? It's a distinct possibility. See, the, one of the big limitations of the work that we've done so far is we've been unable to spend much time in locations where you've got all three species in the same spot. So um, that's why we've gone to so much effort trying to show what's happening at a much broader scale, because when we try and focus in, we can't get the detail that would help answer that that sort of question that you have. So this is going to be something that hangs over this work until because particularly in Ireland, the change happens so quickly. Um, we're just not able to uh, collect the sort of information that we, uh, we would like to to be able to answer that question. So yes, there is a distinct possibility that say, um, uh, like say if you had a, a, a woodland with all three species uh, and the pine martin is focusing on the grey because it's bigger, you know, you know, it makes more sense to spend your energy getting on something that's producing more energy. But yeah, when the grace taken away and the red squirrel numbers go up, now we know in broadleaf woodland they get they get much higher red squirrel uh, densities than you would in conifer plantations. So there is a possibility um, that they they'll start predating those. But um, as Raymond said, it's probably complicated. Then you've got vol cycles in there as well. So that's like totally valid question and the reason we keep try and keep it as simple as this because it's so friggin difficult to try and uh, work out what is going on. So undoubtedly um, in the models that we produced like in Ireland we've got other species like wood mice which are the important small mammal and um, they are likely impacting you know um, uh, the bird species are probably impacting because we find that the birds are an important part of the diet over here compared to uh, compared to you guys in Scotland. So um, yeah, yeah, uh, they will uh, look. I mean, there's no there's no bones about it. It's a predator. It's going to eat whatever it comes across. You know, it's not going to go. Oh, there's a there's a wee red squirrel. I'm not going to bother this time. You know, it's going to take it. And if there's a greater number of them, then it increases the chances of predation happening. So um, do you want me to pop up the picture again? Could could you please, David? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No worries. Uh, bear with me a wee second. And while you're doing that, there was a there was a question from Hebe Karras. Um, Hebe, would you like to uh, ask your question, please? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I've got much more really to add because I'm just mulling over this really. Um, <laughs> so um, I suppose uh, my question is around. Uh, we don't really. You didn't present any information about um, the actual woodland and forests that no. you were doing the research in. Um, so I guess my question was, and this is what I'm observing where I work in Loch Arbor, um, mm. is the likely differences, I guess, of the situation that might be uh, might prevail where there's different woodland sizes and different landscape connectivity. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind we're working a lot at the moment with red squirrels and trying to not have blocks with bigger gaps than red squirrels are comfortable crossing an open land, um, whereas pine martins will be perfectly happy to cross those kind of distances. Um, and obviously that will, I would imagine, make a difference. So that would apply to native woodland and to conifers, uh, conifer plantations, and also uh, thinking about how conifer plantations are managed in terms of clear fell areas and the patterns within forest blocks. Um, and that is likely, I would suppose, make a difference in terms of voles home into clear fells in yeah. plantations. Yeah, no, uh, undoubtedly, uh, all all very true. So, um, yeah, given the complexity of uh, just doing the three species interactions, we never looked at uh, management regimes within uh, the forest. Um, it was just simply looking at whether it was broadleaf or conifer or mixed. Um, but within uh, our study areas in, in Ireland, we don't have the the large plantations that you guys have. The, the forestry, you know, it's it's much smaller, it's much more fragmented. And what we find um, is that the squirrels are using the field boundaries a lot more than you might expect. 
uh, within Scotland. Um, now, this has also been seen in Guernsey, uh, where again, you've got much more fragmented um, forestry landscape. So you've got this species using uh, the field boundaries and the hedgerows and stuff like that. So yes, there's a distinct possibility that uh, picking up uh, and applying this to the large scale systems that you guys have got, you know, there, there, there probably will be changes. But um, we are working with guys uh, in Wales and Harriet Watt to begin looking at uh, these these sort of questions. So hopefully we'll be able to answer it in time. You're probably right as well in saying that we should pay, maybe take a bit more of a, a forestry management approach to this. I think it would be really interesting to look look at, and then we could maybe start to answer some of those 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 questions that you have. So um, do you want me to go over this again? I appreciate. To be honest, right, see the first time I saw this, I was like, what on earth is going on here? But I promise it does make sense um, the longer you look at it. So I think it would be really useful, David. That's yes, all right. Please. That's all right. No worries. Right. So, OK, so what we've got here, uh, you see, um, right. Oops, sorry, guys. Um, um, so, so, oh, oh, uh, so we, so we look at the, the broadleaf woodland. Uh, so this is uh, the red squirrels and grey squirrels in broadleaf woodland. This is uh, the uh, occurrence of red squirrels and grey squirrels in conifer woodland. Now, uh, these two lines, the, the two different colours. So uh, blue represents forests where we've looked at the occurrence of red squirrels in relation to pine martin. And then uh, so with pine martin being present and the red is uh, conifer plantations with red squirrels where pine martin are not present. So so when you see um, when there's no pine martins in conifer plantations, uh, the, the occurrence uh, of these species increases. But with the blue, what you see um, with when red squirrels uh, are present and the presence of uh, pine martin increases, you see a decline, a slight decline in the occurrence of red Dave, squirrels. Dave, sorry, can I just uh, can I just in, interrupt the, um, the, the the shading there? Yep. Does, does that represent confidence limits or? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. It Apologies. Does. Yes. Those are confidence limits. So, yeah. So you can see here, you've got uh, quite wide confidence margins. So we've got greater confidence. Uh, in uh, the absence and presence, and that just simply comes down to um, the the at the higher values, we've got less uh, number of sites. So most of our sites that we're uh, collecting information will probably fall where there's lower confidence margins. Now here with broadleaf woodland at the different uh, population densities, we've got a uh, greater confidence all the way along because we've got a greater a representation of samples across this, the, this period. Does that make sense? Yeah, hopefully. It's making sense to me. I hope okay. so to everyone else. Yeah, thank okay. you. OK, so um, so in relation to the broadleaf, so this, this was a really unexpected result. So the slight decline when you've got the introduction um, of the pine martin into the, the landscape. So this was the, the unexpected. We genuinely did not expect that at all. Um, so broadleaf, you see when the pine martens are present, it, it's better for the red squirrel. And just to clarify that one, Dave, squirrel. the, the so, habitat type of conifer uh -huh. that was generally being looked at, was that yes. sort of wall to wall, unbroken, Sitka, Norway, Larch, with, uh, yeah. uh, uh, with very little age structure diversity yes yep. yes so it would it would primarily have been uh sitka spruce um or norway spruce uh japanese larch would have uh, featured um a little in 2015 but um because of peter morum there's been a lot of clearance over here so and for biosecurity uh measures we tended not, not to go to those locations just in case so larch would not have featured as much um Age-wise, it was typically more mature stands that we were visiting. So yeah, you're I'd imagine, I'd have to look at the data, but I'd imagine you know, you'd be in the, the, at least the 30 years mark. So we're not going into young uh, 20 years or, or under plantation. It's, it's, it's definitely older. 
if that makes sense to you guys. I appreciate I'm not using the terminology that you guys probably use, but um, <laughs> apologies for that. Dave, a quick quick one from Jimmy Farker uh -huh. um, uh, on the um, uh, presence of or absence of squirrel pox in Ireland. Oh, right. OK, yeah, no, squirrel pox is here. Um, uh, it, it's been detected. There's 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 two there's two areas where it keeps turning up in Northern Ireland. So that's uh, Glen Arm uh, on the Antrim coast and also uh, in the Mourne Mountains. Now, it probably occurs elsewhere. It's just, you know, we're not looking. Now, it's only been detected relatively recently in the Republic of Ireland. But to be honest, again, nobody's been looking. So it's probably much more widely um, uh, occurring uh, than we're seeing. So uh, that is work that probably needs to be uh, done. There's not much disease monitoring over here at the minute. Thanks very much for that. Um, no worries. Well, it looks like we may have run out of questions for you. You'll be delighted Sorry. to hear. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it's, 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 as, as I say, it's genuinely good to get your guys' perspective um, because we, we don't have much of an opportunity to interact with, with foresters. So, I mean, we, we like I've genuinely, please do send on any thoughts or comments or things that, you know we could potentially look at because um, you know, we're coming at it from an animal perspective, but, you know, we'd really appreciate your guys' perspective as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally would be fascinated to see th this this research going on, um, but but also um, uh, it's, it's some sampling in 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 Scotland yeah. in, in, in the different um, uh, the, the different sort of uh, forestry setup that we may have here to, yeah. to, to what you've been seeing in Northern Ireland, um, but that that would be quite a big project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, again, referring back to Xavier Lambin from um, Aberdeen, um, I think they quite like the idea of uh, our approach, but undertaken compared to Northern Ireland. So, um, yeah. Maybe Sorry, guys, my internet's all all over the place. It, um, it's it stood up remarkably well for this. Yeah, I'm surprised actually. I'm really surprised. Uh, uh, Dave, we have um uh, Hebe Karas who who uh, asked oh. you a question earlier, um uh, is 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 offering um uh, the chance to, to for for the two of you to 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 get together to um uh, com compare notes and to um uh, uh, and to, to 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 look at the sort of research that that, that she's been carrying out. In Loch Haber. so that might okay. be a useful contact. Absolutely, no, I'll I'll give you a shout. Um, so I'll just take a note of you. Yeah, um, yeah, and likewise, anybody else. I mean, I'll pop my um, my contact details in here. So if 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 you want to reach out, please do. And if uh, likewise with Josh, um, I think do you guys have his contact details that you can share? I'm sure he'd be more than happy to as well. Um, to help if you can. Yes, I have that there for you. Brilliant. Good. All right. Well, thank you. But thank you very much. Um, Dietrich, your um, your camera is on. Could you? Uh, thanks. Um, well, we've come to the uh, we've, we've come to the end of the allotted time. Um, so, uh, uh, if I could please, on everyone's behalf, uh, thank our speakers Neil Cleland and to Dave Tosh for um, for two very good presentations I thought. Um, I'd also like to thank the industry leadership group um, Scottish Forestry and CONFOR, um, Jamie in particular uh, and also to the steering group in Mid Scotland uh, for for, uh, for 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 uh, pulling this this meeting together uh, and of course as usual most of all I'd like to thank all of you for uh, for attending. Um, the next meeting uh, of the Mid Scotland group is scheduled for uh, the 3rd of November this year and if anyone has any suggestions for topics 
uh, they're very welcome to um, pass them on to any members of the steering group.